waiting for the swell of music to go down. It usually plays before we talk about Afghanistan. Um, any, all of us are thrilled to be here to talk about Afghanistan because, frankly, um, the demand has not been huge for us in the last couple of years at international conferences. It's as if 2021 happened and um, that was it for Afghanistan. So we're happy to be here. We also know that we're pretty much the only thing standing between you all and cocktail hour. So we're going to try to make this a conversation, a discussion that might get at some uh, interesting ideas. Um, and yes, I have next to me Andrew Wilder, who um, is with the US Institute of Peace, but he also first went to Afghanistan when he was seven. Um, believe it or not, that's not even ex an exaggeration. Nahid Sarabi, who used to be a high up official uh, in the economics ministry in Afghanistan and is now at the Brookings Institute. Uh, we've got Carter Malkasian, who is indeed with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but um, also wrote the book on Afghanistan as far as the military conflict there is concerned. And Ann Wilder, or Ann Wilder, <laughs> this is Andrew Wilder, um, Ann uh, Richard, who is working a lot with Afghan refugee, uh, Afghan sort of human rights activists, both in the country and outside of the country. And we're going to get to all of that today. It's going to be very exciting. I wanted to start with Nahid who, as an Afghan woman on the panel, I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about her own experience in Afghanistan and also, you know, sort of the same things that Ramatullah was talking about, the idea of what it was like to be an Afghan and have this international force come in um, to try to change the country and, and, and put in democracy there. Um, thank you, Kim. So um, let me go back and talk about uh, my first memory of Taliban. Um, I was um, 10 years old, and the first version of Taliban came into power. I say version because I do not believe in that versioning of the Taliban, but I deliberately said it because I want to have a uh, context for it. For me, Taliban is one version. So whoever uses version 1.0 or 2.0, for me, that nullifies everything. So when Taliban for the first time took control of Kabul. I remember we were at a dinner at a relative's place. And then out of sudden, somebody came in the room and said, Taliban have taken over Kabul. And um, I couldn't make much sense of it, but I knew it was going to be brutal. Um, so the next day, what my family did was uh, um, we, we had, it was a Mujahideen era, obviously, everybody had their hijabs, but it wasn't the Taliban required hijab. So we had these bed sheets um, from the family and we all wore it and went to our house. Um, and then the next day, there were other versions of decrees coming in and imposing um, 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 restrictions on women and everybody. So that was my first... Um, memory of the Taliban. And then um, we went to Pakistan because I couldn't go to school. My family made the choice of migrating to Pakistan just because I couldn't go to school and my mom made that very specific. And then after seven years of um, staying as a refugee in Pakistan, um, and then suddenly I was listening to BBC because at that point our only source of information was this radio news that was coming from across the world. And um, they told us that 9-11 uh, attack has happened and U.S. is going to bomb Afghanistan. Um, to be honest, I had conflicting views about my country being bombed and whether um, it was the right choice to be made. But... Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm still conflicted that there were some good stuff that came out of it and there were some um, people who really suffered. And when you go back to the history and, and events that keep shaping up, you cannot discount the vulnerabilities, the victimhood of some people also as part of the successes that you have made. So that is my memory, that's how I remember 9-11. Um, and from there, when I look back at 20 years, and in 2021, when I had to escape Afghanistan because Taliban took over once again, and um, unexpectedly, the way it, it, it happened, 
I keep wondering whether those sacrifices were really worth it. Yes, for some, but um, did we make the right choices at the right points? And then we are, we are once again back to the same spot where we began, unfortunately. So that's, that's my overall picture of, of Taliban in, in the history in 20 years. But I can go in on and on of the advantages and disadvantages. Um, maybe if we have time at the end. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Andrew, I don't think it was me. Um, Andrew, uh, building off what Nahid was just talking about, can you talk a bit about the idea of finding a political solution to the conflict in Afghanistan and, and missed opportunities and why that didn't work ultimately? You know, again, I work for a Peace Institute, so I bring that bias, and it's great to be here at the Pearson Center where there's lots of people looking at issues of what fuels conflict and trying to focus on conflict resolution. Uh, there's far too little of that being done. Um, USIP was actually founded uh, in large part by a grassroots movement of former veterans from World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam who had seen the horrors of war firsthand and really felt the need that in addition to a strong defense, uh, there is a need for more investment in the cold conflict prevention peace building field. And to me, I think that's still critically important. And in Afghanistan, you know, again, I first went as a tourist. My family went up, my family on a tourist trip up the Khyber Pass and up to Bamiyan. And, uh, and, you know, just to say there were, have been times of peace in Afghanistan, and it's a fabulously beautiful country. So someday I hope you can all, all visit. I wouldn't recommend it right now. Um, um, but to me, the problems in Afghanistan have largely been political conflicts um, and, you know, a lot of different drivers of conflict that many of you will have been studying. There's ethnic divisions, there's political tensions, there's clan things, tribal rivalries, regional politics, war economies, drug economies, various things that people have been fighting over and not very effective institutions in terms of how to divvy up uh, the pie. Um, of course, we were worried about Afghanistan in the 80s. I first started my career, professional career in Afghanistan in the mid 80s, uh, in a way thanks to Charlie Wilson's war, uh, those of you familiar with that. Um, where the whole sort of floodgates of covert assistance started in the mid 80s, but also humanitarian assistance. Um, and I started working in the humanitarian sector then. Um, again, a very different set of conflict dynamics, but again, fueled by politics primarily. 9-11 um, happened, it changed the context very quickly. Um, you know, not surprisingly, it was terrorism focused, it was a war on terror. Um, so not, I think, I'm not critical of the intervention in the beginning. Um, I think, frankly, any American president at that time would have had to respond in the way uh, President Bush responded. Um, but the war on terror was essentially won in Afghanistan by December of 2001 in terms of defeating Al Taliban, who had been hosting Al Qaeda, and some of them, you know, Osama bin Laden hadn't been captured or killed, but essentially the threat of terrorism in Afghanistan at that time um, had largely been addressed. And I think that was the time to quickly recognize that the fundamental issues aren't terrorism right now, it's a political problem and how do we address those. And so I think the first missed opportunity, which many commentators have talked about, most famously Lakhdar Brahimi, uh, who was the UN Special Envoy at the time, talked about the original sin being not bringing the Taliban to the Bonn Agreement, which I think Ramatullah um, was mentioned in the video clip um, in December 2001. It was basically a, a, a meeting of the victors of the war to decide again who's going to get what. Um, and there was an opportunity then. Um, however, I don't think it's politically realistic, hindsight's 2020, to think that any, again, U.S. president uh, with the uh, you know, memories of 9-11 so fresh, could have uh, somehow invited the Taliban to participate in the bond pro process. However, we could have at that time, I think, started distinguishing that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, are two different things, and, and just the using labels like terrorism and that we don't negotiate with terrorists made coming up with a political solution um, difficult. But 
fast forward, I would say a lot of the problems then stem by, you know, again, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, and by far our largest tool in Afghanistan was our military force. And so often looking for the military solutions, uh, initially from a CT lens, then from a counterinsurgency lens, um, and not recognizing, I was actually you know, supportive of the military inter intervention there, but it was quite clear, certainly by I think 2009 or 10, that the war was not winnable. Um, the insurgency couldn't be defeated purely by military means. Um, and that there was a need then, I think, to pivot to trying to look for a political negotiated end to the conflict. And our military was our main source of leverage in that negotiation. Um, however, the U.S. military, and Carter can, is more, much more of the expert on this than I am, uh, doesn't, you know, ha doesn't have a, a doctrine for war termination other than to win the war. And Chris Kalenda has actually written quite a bit about this. Um, uh, and yet, we haven't been winning so many wars of late, and we need to be trying to think about how can we can use the military more as a political tool in some of these contexts, where I think it may have been possible uh, to use the military to put pressure on the Taliban to come to the negotiating table. And yet, our military leadership at the time uh, thought that a peace process might undermine the military effort or always wanting to get in the position of a stronger negotiating military position to negotiate from a position of, of strength. Um, and yet, in retrospect, the time of greatest strength was probably 2010 when we had 100,000 US forces, 40,000 NATO forces. Um, and yet, at that time, there was still not much support from General Petraeus to support a peace process at that time. So anyway, many missed opportunities. I could go on. I won't, but uh, on, I think. If we have time yes. at the end, we can go on. <laughs> on missed opportunities, I think, to try to achieve a political settlement to the conflict. Carter, can you build on that a little bit and talk about, I mean, you were in, was it, for two years you were in the district in Helmand, or was it That's just for, correct. Yeah. We're going to talk about that a bit. Yeah, can you talk about that a little bit, and also just about what you learned by being there, about what the military was doing in Afghanistan and the likelihood for it succeeding? Yeah, I'm happy to. So to ping off of something that Kim said at the beginning, you know, right now when it comes to Afghanistan, we're undergoing an enforced exercise in forgetting. Right now, for anyone in the government or attached to the government or the military, you're not really supposed to talk about Iraq or Afghanistan. You're su supposed to talk about strategic competition and technology and the new issues. And if you deal with Afghanistan, then you don't get it. Or you're talking about things that are in the past. So let's talk a little bit about the past. During the height of our engagement in Afghanistan, there were lots of Americans who knew an incredible amount about Afghanistan about small parts of Afghanistan. I knew more about a district in Afghanistan, which is about the size of a US county, than I know about any county in the United States, including the one that I'm from. But there were lots of Americans who were doing the same thing, lots of internationals who were doing the same thing, who could speak the language, who knew the history of the area, who had lots of wonderful Afghan friends, and were understanding as much of the culture as they possibly could. Today, a lot of the focus of the government um, and, and on aid and development is not to have people know so much, to focus more on the center, to focus more on the cities. Not sure that that's right. So let me start with a quick stories from, uh, from Garmsir. Garmsir is a district in southern Afghanistan, and I spent about two years working there as a State Department political officer. When I got there, I worked with a district governor who was older, and he had been initially selected by a council, a shura, of local leaders. And he had actually been selected like back in the 1990s. The government then said it's fine, he can continue to be district governor uh, later on. And he was someone who paid a lot of attention to what the people said, was worried about the balance between the tribes, and was very worried if any collateral damage was done for the people. He was very cognizant that his job depended on the people supporting him. And not all of them supported him by any means. There's lots of controversies and everything else. So he was around for about the first year I was there. The second year I was there, we got a new district governor. And he was young. He was 22. He had been appointed by Kabul. He was not from the district. He was appointed by Noshura. 
he, he had a good heart, but he spent a lot of time on the phone with Kabul, a lot of time on the phone trying to hear what the bosses in Kabul wanted to be done. He was much less worried about what the people had to say. So when we talk about why there were problems in Afghanistan, one of the most prominent explanations, one of the most important theoretical explanations, is that we had a construct of government in which the center, Kabul, decided who was going to run things at the local level, decided who the governors were going to be and the district governors were going to be. And because those governors and district governors were appointed by Kabul, do you think they looked up? Or do you think they looked down? Or do you think they looked up? <laughs> they looked up. Their interests were, were, going, were, were up there. And anthropologist uh, Thomas Barfield argues that because they were looking up, they didn't care about the people, they didn't attend to the people enough, and therefore, many of the people turned to the Taliban. They were willing to do harm to the people in order to satisfy what was happening above them. This argument has been further um, elaborated and elucidated upon by people like Jennifer Matasha Vili, uh, who has shown that local institutions can help feed the way to state building by creating credible leaders. And of course, Professor Roger Meyerson has also had a prominent role in this by saying how important it is that local leaders are accountable to the local population. Now, there's of course a, a hitch in this argument. There's a hitch if the international community in any country was to say that we would just let everything happen at the local level. Because sometimes what Professor Meyerson has called local despots come to rule. People who have guns or money and aren't accountable to the people, they're accountable to their guns and their money. And they can force their will upon the people. Or sometimes you'll have a majority group in a district, say a majority tribe, they will use the vote to get their person in power, but once they have it, then they're going to harm the minority, the tyranny of the majority. So how does one deal with this problem? Well, there's a few ways to deal with it. One is local areas often have their own checks and balances that exist on these kind of things. For example, the council, the shura, that appointed the first district governor I worked with, they're a form of check on that. He knows he in some way is answerable to this council. And if he doesn't do what they want, they're going to remove him. So that's a local way, but that's not the only way. Religious leaders can often form that kind of check. And in places other than Afghanistan, civil society plays a tremendous role as a check, especially if you're in Latin America. So there's different local ways to create these checks to happen. Another kind of check is for the international community to have some awareness of who is malicious, and who is benevolent, who is helping democratic state building and who is not, and to only help those who are democratic. As Jennifer Motoshvili says, the central role of state building um, is identifying who is working towards democracy and helping them and harnessing that. OK, so let me come back to my beginning. If you want to work at the local level, if you want to enable state building at the local level, which may well be better than centralized state building, and you want to prevent local despots from taking power, what do you need? You need local knowledge. You need people who understand the language, who understand what's happening, who can identify what local institutions are serving as a checks and balance, and are also wise enough to know when you shouldn't go too far and you're now into someone's sovereignty, who have enough respect of the country um, to know that they in no way can control this country. So we still need this. We still need this knowledge from people. We still need people to be involved in it. And that's what I, I hope that's a lesson we won't forget from Afghanistan and we'll focus on. So. I mean, one thing I'll push back real quick on is the military aspect, though. And like the whole idea of like the military's role there, the over reliance on the military of solving the problem. Um, well, you probably noticed in what I was saying, I didn't yeah. say that the military I know. should, should I know. do it. It was State Not Department. The <laughs> I'm a so, journalist. i got to follow up. Uh, so I think there is a role for the military. And there is a role for the military in having knowledge of what's happening locally. Because then they will be less, less, less likely to make mistakes. Should the military be in, fault in charge of state building? No, the military shouldn't be in, in charge of state building. So. Thank you. Um, Anne, I know you've been working a lot lately. Uh, let's move, we're going to move a little bit to the present. And then we're going to move to the future, believe it or not. In the next 20 minutes, it's going to be impressive. 
And can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing with Freedom House and talk, dealing with people on a regular basis who are still in Afghanistan and human rights folks who've been able to get out of Afghanistan and what they're facing and what you're hearing on the ground? Thanks, Kim. So at Freedom House, we care about the spread of democracy around the world and protection of human rights. Um, and so uh, Freedom House has sort of a global beat, but and also runs programs sometimes to help individual human rights champions who get into trouble with their um, governments and need to get help fast. Um, but obviously the seizure of Kabul by the Taliban left a lot of people in the lurch all at once. And uh, for those of you who were watching in August of 2021, it was not a so-called orderly departure. Um, and this continues to be sort of a bitter uh, a memory for everybody who, who, who tracks Afghanistan. So when we look at the 20 years of the US involvement, coalition countries involvement, um, this massive investment by um, governments and non-governmental organizations and UN agencies, there were a lot of Afghans involved in this, in this 20-year experiment to build um, a democracy in Afghanistan, to build a republic. And so um, the, those chaotic scenes at Hamid Karzai International Airport did result in some people getting out of Afghanistan, f fearing that if they stayed, they'd be targeted by the Taliban. But lots and lots and lots of people were left behind. And they, they range from former combatants to um, people who worked as translators, as truck drivers, as cooks, people who worked for the military, and people who worked for the US Embassy and other embassies. Um, and they feel very much threatened by staying um, in, in Afghanistan. And then there were people who were journalists. Uh, people who were working in the government, judges, who put Taliban folks in jail. And the folks that uh, at Freedom House were most concerned about are human rights defenders. Uh, people who were speaking up and trying to create change in the society. And so how are they faring now that the Taliban has come in? Well, it's terrible as expected, but it's sort of worse than expected in some ways because obviously the Taliban has ignored any promises they made during negotiations about a general amnesty. And so they have been going out against people that they consider their opponents. And then um, we see that they consider people who are their opponents as not just uh, ex-military or ex-government, but also people who are ethnic minorities, like the Haz Hazara. And then there's this other category that normally are not singled out in conflict for special um, uh, toughness, and that's women. So a massive number of edicts have been issued now to completely shrink the life of women and girls inside Afghanistan in a way that has essentially left women as prisoners inside their own houses. And the best source of finding out about these edicts is actually at the US Institute of Peace. So I'll give credit there. Uh, and um, when you look at what is not allowed anymore, you could potentially think for a second of, well, you can't go to the movies. Well, you can't go to a park. Is that really so bad? But it really is so bad. You know, Not being able to go to a beauty salon is much more uh, horrible than not being allowed, someone telling you you can't go to the beauty salon today. Because it means girls are not going to get educated past age 11. People who were getting educated have to stop their studies. People who were working outside the home are told to stay at home. People in many different sectors of the um, society are no longer expected to work or told to work. And um, so it's not just about clothing and covering your hair and wearing long sleeves. It's, it's about um, shrinking one's life down for half the, at least half the uh, population. And so 
it's also really damaging any kind of future for these people, of course, but also for Afghanistan. So what can we do about this? Um, we tried to, at Freedom House, work with other um, organizations, including Afghan organizations, especially Afghan organizations, to reach people who are inside Afghanistan, where they're afraid and need help and information, but also people who have fled to the surrounding neighborhood, because it's a tough neighborhood. In Pakistan, a lot of refugees do not feel safe. They feel that they're being har harassed by the police. Uh, they feel that information about where they are is getting back into Afghanistan. And now there's the threat of mass deportation coming from the Pakistani government. It has been very generous about hosting Afghans for a long time. Iran is the other uh, country that um, a lot of Afghans in the past have gone to work in. I refer you to the earlier lectures on Iran, and so that's not <laughs> ideal, and then Central Asia. And then there are programs to bring some Afghans to Canada, to the UK, to Australia, to the US. The ones to the US are oversubscribed, running very, very slow, and don't, not everybody who really deserves these programs qualify for them. So it's, we owe these folks, I believe, um, and yet, in many ways, they fear they are being left in the lurch. There's two Afghans who've already spoken, so they can speak better than I can about that. But what I hear from the human rights folks we're talking to, they worry about their own families, they worry about their lives, they worry about their families left back in Afghanistan if they've moved on. But they also worry that the world will negotiate something with the Taliban to move on that will essentially give away and, or, or, or put a stamp of approval on the way um, minorities and women um, and, and girls are being treated in the country. And so that is a very, very um, hot issue, I would say. I want to come back to that in a minute. Um, first of all, I want to talk to Nahid about, you were a government official, right? You were a woman working in the government of Afghanistan. I'm assuming you still know people working in the government there. How is the government functioning with the Taliban? I mean, how does the country actually work? How is it running things? Am I allowed to go a little bit back? In, in yeah, you're, you're, yeah. The, no, just, just you're not allowed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're allowed to say whatever you want. Can I use the opportunity yeah. of being an Afghan here? So. Yeah, um, just please to do. Just to point, because I do want to address this. Absolutely agree that there was need for decentralization and more local knowledge. But something that came as a construct of state building at the beginning, and Rahmatullah referred to that in his presentation, was the Bonn Conference that gave opportunity to these warlords. And as a result, they just built these fiefdoms inside Afghanistan that wasn't allowing any form of decentralization. I, I have a story about it. In 2004, the former then Minister of Finance had to go to a province in Western Afghanistan and collect the revenues in suitcases, verbally fighting, negotiating, and bringing back to the coffers of the government. That was how the government affairs were Wait, which, being managed. Which warlord was that? It's not, it's not plan. <laughs> Western <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, let's, let's keep it there. <laughs> but, um, of course, later in the years, there were many opportunities that were lost. Um, and sometimes that's, that's why I, I, when I say I have conflicts about the structures that were then put together, that there were mistakes that, that just became irreversible. Coming back to now, um, let's remember when August 2021 happened and many people got evacuated. Not everybody got to move out of Afghanistan. There are still millions of people who want to preserve dignity, who want to preserve whatever is left of the past 20 years or before that. There's still an entire structure of civil service who are functioning inside of Afghanistan, but under the leadership of Taliban and the brutality that, there is being, uh, that they are being subjugated to. But we, c we have to re remember that Taliban do not have a choice, so they do not have the elements, the capability to run the government that they, they, they feel um, or obligated to run. But there are also um, another issue that how you define governance. For example, Afghanistan doesn't have a transparent budget. 
Taliban are collecting 2.2 billion revenues, domestic revenue, that even the Republic couldn't collect due to many other reasons that we can, um, there's no time to discuss. But there's no transparency as how that revenue is being spent. Of course, we hear that they are spending much of the revenue on security expenses. I don't know what, what insecurity are they trying to deal with right now at the moment. But um, so that's the way their form of governance is. Their form of governance is to abolish Ministry of Women Affairs and put the vice and virtue ministry instead to go and control every aspect of social life um, inside Afghanistan. Um, and, and, and the fact that um, the humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan has been helping, and uh, without, it goes without saying that it is inadvertently helping Taliban um, spend their own resources the way they want to, because um, the UN agencies and in, in the national community, which is really valid, is spending a lot on humanitarian aid. Um, I've, I've also, I've, it's, it's an anecdote, but, but um, I've heard from many sources that it's true that uh, their government, well, a sort of prime minister, had told um, somewhere that it is the international community's obligation to feed the people, not mine. Um, so that's, that's their meaning in terms of governance. And if you define governance in the way they want to, then yes. But in my view, there's not enough of governance happening. So you've got civil servants who are still working for the government. No women. They're all, yes. They've all been sent home or they've fled. Um, and then you have the Taliban that's the layer over, over the top of it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Carter, can you talk a little bit? I know you had history dealing with the, some of the Taliban leaders. Can you talk a bit and explain how exactly, what it, the Taliban needs and the government means? And Andrew, you should feel free to weigh in on this as well, because I know you know a lot about the subject. So the Taliban are run by an emir. Um, and so that person is, he comes into power basically by selection of the rest of the Taliban leadership. That emir is currently Moli Hebatullah. Moli Hebatullah lives in Kandahar. Moli Hebatula is fairly um, hard line. Um, there's a story that his son was a suicide bomber. It may have been his adopted son, but regardless, it's a fairly shocking thing. So it's said that he is very much in favor of the hard line policies of the government that the government has put in place. The Taliban has a variety of other leaders um, within it um, that um, some of them are, are interpreting religious laws, others are running ministries. Um, such as the son of Mullah Omar, runs the Ministry of Defense, Sirajuddin Haqqani, who used to be conducting suicide bombing attacks. Um, he, runs, uh, he runs the Ministry of Interior. So that's, that's what the leadership looks like. The leadership also, a lot of them come from a religious background. A lot of them were, had come from being mullahs in a village or had been educated in madrasas or had actually been like religious scholars with actual, some degree of actual credentials behind them. So they feel very strongly that they are in a position to interpret Islam to the people. Whether they're interpreting correctly or not is, a, is an entirely separate issue. Um, so they feel strongly in that regard. Then besides that, there's also all the people who fought for the Taliban, who fought with the Taliban. And that's a wide swath of Afghan society. Not the majority of Afghan society by any means. Um, but there are young men from a, young men at one, one time young, some of them are older now, uh, who are from a variety of different villages. Sometimes they were from poorer tribes and from poor areas that had, had been maybe mistreated from the government, never had a lot of opportunity. A lot of them had also been refugees in Pakistan. Um, so that's a good, a good amount of their base. So when we talk about the Taliban, and like one reason I think that they're trying to spend money on the military right now is because that's where all those fighters are now. And if they stop paying them, they might have a very big problem. So that, that's, a, that's a quick rundown on the Taliban. Great. Do you have anything you wanted to add on that, Andrew? Maybe just in the 1990s, I was to say the children director when the Taliban first took over in 1996, took over Kabul in 1997, most of the rest of the country, not all of it. But it was similar. There would be a, a Taliban figure sitting at the top of the ministry, but all the civil servants below are sort of what kept things going. Um, uh, and to be honest, back then, the situation of the Civil War in the early 90s was so horrible, um, the Taliban were welcomed. I mean, that, say the children, we had about 100 staff in Kabul, half of them women, 
everyone was happy when the Taliban first came in because they put an end to the, the civil war and terrible violence, including which destroyed much of Kabul at the time. Um, <clears throat> and they were less corrupt. Uh, however, you know, after a little bit, people get used to having stability, um, and you know they don't want just the stability of the graveyard. They want light, a little more life than that. And I think <laughs> that's that's what your I think could be the challenge of the Taliban moving forward. Initially, you know, now you know they're not as corrupt as the previous government that was in power, um, but you're starting to hear the first reports of corruption. You know, building to get your passports or to get visas. You know, their customs revenue is better than the previous government because you know it wasn't all stolen but you're beginning to see issues with that so again I think we're going to see, it's going to get harder and harder for them which is why I think again is we need to be thinking about a future that could be different and I don't know if that's six months from now one year now five years from ten years but we have a history of missed opportunities in Afghanistan so I would argue that we should be preparing now to take advantage of a, potentially a change where things could move in a better direction. Let's talk about what Anne brought up a little while ago, the whole idea of the thorny issue of recognizing the Taliban, right? And the whole issue is basically between whether you keep isolating this country and you keep sanctions on it and let people starve, right? Because that's what's going to happen. Or whether you try to some sort of carrot and stick approach to gain some sort of like, hey, if you give women the right to work or girls the right to go to school, then we'll give you this carrot. Can you all sort of weigh in on where you stand on that spectrum of whether the Taliban, there should be any recognition or any working with the Taliban, maybe starting with you, Anne, and working our way down? Yeah, there is definitely engagement approaches to the Taliban happening by international diplomats um, and policymakers trying to convince them to change their ways. Um, and uh, it appears that Western governments don't have a lot of leverage, that the Taliban is very, and you, you can talk more yeah. about this, I guess, sort of immune to um, the pressures coming from places like Washington and London and Paris, et cetera. Um, and then um, among the folks that I work with, the human rights defenders, they have really been upset when um, people have made noises that sound like moving towards recognition. So the example is the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations said something about getting on a track. I, 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 I will misquote her if I try to quote her, but it was interpreted as a saying, let's just start moving in that direction towards recognition. And so there was this, just you know, across the social media sphere, everybody saying, no, no, you can't do that. And then there was also uh, Tobias Elwood uh, from the a British MP, who I'd worked with in the past, actually, who went for a visit and said, well, it's much more peaceful now. You know, the, there's no shooting at each other. And then he was also uh, pinpointed as someone who had fallen for the Taliban's propaganda. And um, he was kicked out of his, uh, I forget what it was, his, his coalition. So um, somehow there has to be a conversation with the Taliban if anything's going to change. But how you do that and not empower the Taliban, how you do that and get them to change their minds is, I think, a really wicked problem. Definitely, definitely. Um, so I was a part, for a while, I was part of the negotiating team that was negotiating with the Taliban in Doha. So I got to interact with a certain number of, of their leaders there. And so a few things, I think, that, that are relevant there. One is they would tend to say, oh, don't worry. Once we sign this agreement, everything will be OK. We'll take care of women's rights. We'll have a unity government. Everything's just going to be fine. And they'd often say a lot of things to please us, hence what you just said. Some people could not fall for it, but you know, maybe, maybe judge incorrectly. On, <clears throat> but a few things, two things there that were informative. One, when you press them on women's rights, you get a story that was basically like this. We protect women. We make sure that they are safe. We make sure that they can't be harmed from the rest of the world. It is you in the West who open up women to harm. It is in the West that bad things happen to women. It is in the West because you let them go out of the house, you let them work, you let them go to movies, let them dance, et cetera, that problems come. So you'd hear that, which was an indication of what people were thinking. 
The other thing, we, we'd often be talking to them about, or you need to have an inclusive government, or there needs to be an inclusive government. We need to negotiate for an inclusive in gov government once, you once we tell you what our withdrawal timeline is going to be. And like I said before, they'd say, oh, no problem, inclusive government, definitely. But if you press them on it, you'd get reactions. For example, the most, one of the most moderate members of the Taliban delegation, when pressed, kind of got angry and said, you know, we've been fighting for 20 years. It's our turn to be in power. We can have a monopoly if we want to have a monopoly. They were there for 20 years. They're out. We're in. We're, we're in charge. So the, the Taliban, are, those are some of the feelings they have. Why do they feel some of these things? The Taliban have always cared about unity. They've cared about um, being united, one, one group. And that's partly because they remember the Civil War of the 90s. They remember the disorder there. And they feel that, that you can't bring Afghanistan together if you allow these different groups to exist. They feel that very strongly. And so when you get to someone like Hay Batul, who's deciding whether or not he wants to deal with the West, he's thinking about, or I don't know what he's thinking, but I think these kind of thoughts about that the Taliban really protect women and are really following Islam and are staying united by doing it, this is going to have, this is going to have some impact. This is going to have some importance. So it's going to be hard to get them to move off of that. I think, personally, I think there isn't a, a good like, practical reason not to reopen an embassy, start providing aid. But we shouldn't think that in return for that, the Taliban are going to give us anything. And then there's a domestic side to this, which we have to be cognizant of. That that's a very hard position for any US political leader to take that they're going to reopen relations with the Taliban. I suspect most US political leaders are just going to want Afghanistan out of the news and not have to deal with it. So. Recognition. <laughs> that is, um, it's not <coughs> black and white, like my dress. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm happy I have a gray, uh, gray color here. I'm gray. So, um, when it comes to women issues and why Taliban are pressing on it, so personally, and we can all disagree or agree about, one thing is they react to it as much as it is their own ideology. So the moment you put pressure, they stick to one thing that you know is going to place a leverage on international or global policy issues. The second thing, and it hurts me to say this, because Taliban know that if they bring up women issues, there is not enough standing for Afghan women from the international community. And I, and I felt this, that we Afghan women are kind of left alone in this struggle. Um, I, I'm so encouraged by what is being discussed around gender apartheid with Iranian comrades of, um, in this comradeship. But there are also nuances in the gender apartheid being recognized as a, um, as a crime, um, it, is, it, it is going to have different results in, in Iran than it is going to have in Afghanistan. We are a poor nation. Any sanction on humanitarian aspects would harm us so much than any other country. We do not have um, the, the tendency to, to, to keep uh, our people on, on, on their feet like other countries. So it's, it's going to be very, 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 um, um, it will have strong implications on Afghanistan and we have to recognize that. Now I'm not saying let's not recognize gender apartheid. Obviously it is a regime that is perpetuating gender apartheid. Um, recognition is, I don't even want to use the word right now because that's that's the only leverage that's the only leverage that international community has got over the taliban and if we are going to play that then you're not going to get anything out of the discourse but something that i am pro is um, engagement that is happening um, whether it is in form of humanitarian aid whether it's form of informing Taliban that what, what would be the implications of the gender apartheid being recognized as a crime. And, um, and one, one another thing, there, there has to be a consistency from the international and global um, a, a, a point of view, is um, do not engage, do not give them um, courage over what they have done on security. I, I keep getting these reports that security has improved 
who were the first people who, were, who created such situations in Afghanistan or insecurity? They were the Taliban. And right now, just a few years, um, a few days ago, there was a mosque that was bombed inside Afghanistan. There was a market that was put on fire, and then later on we got the news that it was bombed. It was like Shia, Hazara areas, minorities are not feeling safe. What type of security are we talking about? And for me also, we, I, I keep bring this, bringing this up that peace has different meanings for different people. For a lot of people, peace is not just um, absence of bullets. Peace is um, a, a collection of values that, that you accept and collection of norms and um, a structure, a social structure, a governance structure that gives you the opportunity, that extends opportunities for you, not the one that blocks you from your fundamental rights. Um, yes, engagement is a way forward, but it has to be principled. And I don't see much on those principles coming forward from the international community. Andrew, do you have anything to add? Just <clears throat> definitely not recognition now, because as Nahid said, we don't have much leverage. That's one thing the Taliban want that we, uh, I think, don't need to give them yet until we see some changes in policies. But definitely engagement. I mean, we have to, and we are engaging. And you know, there are certainly still areas of where there's some mutual interest, whether that's in counterterrorism issues. I think neither of us like ISIS-K in Afghanistan, so I'm sure that there's probably engagement on some of the CT-related issues. Um, humanitarian assistance, an incredibly scary situation. We're heading towards a fiscal cliff and, and funding to cry. Only one third of the humanitarian appeal, UN appeal, has been uh, funded, uh, and interest is rapidly diminishing. So um, there, you know, it's been positive, I think, that the U.S. has remained engaged, and other Western donors in particular, in terms of trying to make sure the humanitarian assistance. There's American detainees. I mean, you know, various range of things why we have to remain engage, but definitely not, not recognition. But also, as I mentioned earlier, we need to start be thinking about someday something will shift, because I don't think that the current order is sustainable. I actually do feel that you need a more inclusive government in the long term, and that the, you know, a small uh, band of men, primarily from the South, uh, uh, from one ethnic group are not going to be able to, I think, maintain stability and hold on to it. Or, you know, the, the, I think the tensions within their own ranks, regional tensions as neighbors start getting unhappy, uh, a variety of factors I think are going to leave over time to tensions. I think that's why we need to be remaining engaged and, and have people we can talk to in that kind of context. Right. We're going to take some questions from the audience and It'll be kind of a lightning round because we don't have all that much time left. Um, Andrew, you mentioned that we need to be ready in the coming years to help Afghanistan to move to a better place. What will change to create that opening for U.S. and others to help? I don't know. Um, all, I, <laughs> all I do know is that we have been surprised many times in Afghanistan um, in terms of you know, when I was there in the 90s, it was a hopeless situation. Every Afghan I know was trying to get out of the country. Um, dark, dark days. And then, you know, the U.S. intervention happened. And, yeah, I know there's conflicted some feelings on it. But, you know, for the most part, the Afghans I knew at the time just thought there's a new lease on life. But there could be a, a different future for Afghanistan. The first now rose or new, Afghan New Year's in 2002, the highways were packed with traffic of Afghan families going to picnic and listening to music and things they couldn't have done for five years before under the Taliban regime. So we were taken by surprise there and weren't prepared. So again, I don't know when it's going to happen, uh, but I do think it's going to be happening and we would again be making a mistake if we don't prepare for that. Nahid. How does the brain drain of educated people of Afghanistan impact a potential change in Afghanistan? If all the educated people leave, who's to bring change within the, the nation? Can you bring change abroad? Lots of questions there. You're on the spot. Yes. Um, again, there isn't one answer to this. I'm so sorry I'm disappointing you here. But um, um, listen, the, it's not. As much as education is important, I think the social change, um, it, it, uh, human nature is so unpredictable. Sometimes social change do not come only from the educated people. Uh, people, you have to recognize this. When people get uh, frustrated with a kind of governance and institution that is oppressing them, 
um, it, is, it is just human nature to demand justice. And, uh, and I'm hopeful that it is flourishing day by day inside Afghanistan. And one of the reasons you don't see many uprisings is because of the oppressive nature of the regime that is brutalizing everybody. So people are really um, unhappy about, uh, about how it's going and, and they see the rest to their lives. But you also see women coming on the street and demanding justice um, um, and change from the regime. Um, I'm, me sitting here can, can be a leverage or um, can be a medium of what people inside the Afghanistan want. But the real change has to come from inside the country. And as much as it is, um, it is difficult and painful, that is the only sustainable way. Now, I have to be, um, we have to be cautious about one thing, that there has been a narrative that's shaping up and it's supporting the Taliban these days. Is you are diaspora, you don't have any legitimacy to talk mm -hmm. about issues in, uh, inside yeah, Afghanistan. That's gonna happen. And then you are people from inside Afghanistan, and I would hear you. Now, there's also risk to it because not many people have access to what we have abroad, uh, and not many programs are running inside the country, and especially women who would have access to internet, have access to international community. Um, there are some human rights organizations that who, who are trying to be a medium um, of, of, people, of people's views, but that is not enough. So what our role as diaspora, that I, I am hesitant of calling myself diaspora because first of all, I do not have a status in the US as of now, I'm still a refugee. Um, and plus, I, I do have attachments, I do have stakes in Afghanistan. And if you see Afghanistan in form of a modern state uh, or, or a desire to have Afghanistan back on its feet, I do have as much a stake as people inside Afghanistan. So that's, that's where I, I put the dot or connect the dot. This one's uh, for Carter. Will a terrorist threat return to Afghanistan with the Taliban in power? Um, there could be a terrorist threat that returns that would, that would um, be a threat toward the rest of the world from, from the Taliban. That, that's, a, that's a distinct possibility there. What we want to do is look back and recognize um, that the terrorist threat was overblown after 2001, and so we don't want to overreact when a terrorist threat reemerges. We want to think carefully about what we're doing, and also how any reaction, what the effect would be on the Afghan people, to go back to your first point. Um, so I think one of the lessons from the war should be that we should lean on being resilient more than on reacting. Um, now, I'm saying that, I'm, please don't take that to mean something about Gaza. I'm only talking about Afghanistan right here. <laughs> um, what steps can be taken, I'm going to ask this one to you, Anne. What steps can be taken to ensure the safety and empowerment of Afghan women, considering the limited international focus compared to other refugee crises? Um, well, I think uh, that, uh, a large part of the Afghan economy was dependent on international aid before. And then it all just stopped. And we've got to figure out a way to get support in to help the people who are brave enough to march in the streets, who are speaking up, who are trying to deliver humanitarian aid while they wait to turn back into human rights uh, speakers again. Um, and so when, when we talk about isolating Afghanistan, we're also sort of uh, abandoning uh, some pretty courageous people. Uh, I've been amazed that the sort of younger, uh, the, what the, the people who ended up on the airplanes were people who were well known to embassies. Uh, the people who are marching in the streets is a new generation of younger people who are risking their lives, as, as they are in Iran, risking their lives by marching in the streets. And so um, the more we can figure out what do they need, how can we get that help to them, some of it is that we do is provide um, very quickly uh, uh, lessons on how to keep your computers and your, your cell phones, your smartphones safe uh, so that nobody's crap tapping into it, um, how to keep yourself safe, uh, how to, what to do about your mental health, which is a massive issue, um, and uh, you know, uh, how, to, how to get the, the help you need for, to keep your family safe short term and medium term. 
One last yes or no question. Um, 10 years, will the Taliban be running Afghanistan? Andrew. No. Nahid. There's an element of wishful thinking, but no. <clears throat> I hope no, and I, I believe, I want to believe no, no. Carter? I'm not sure, but I'll say yes, just to make sure we have the possibility on the table, because it's not an insignificant <laughs> possibility. You heard it here it, first. It's, <laughs> it's, re it's a reasonable possibility. As an alumna uh, with a master's of public policy from the University of Chicago, I expect in 10 years you'll all have figured this out. <laughs> um, thanks very much for staying for this panel. Uh, we very much appreciate it, and thank you for all your questions.